Um, so a couple initial announcements first. Uh, so first off, Spotify is continuing to expand. So we've got outros, we've got other goodies. Make sure to check us out and follow us on there. You'll see that the episodes are best viewed holistically to paint a broader picture about the world as it relates to Web3 trends, etc. Feel free to download. Um, audio is also being upgraded. So for those of you who have listened more than once, you'll notice that the audio is, is now elevated to an even better level, courtesy of uh, several folks. Um, we'll also get some music and other fun goodies incorporated soon, too. So that'll be pretty exciting. And a reminder also that application to be uh, a guest on Numbers Therapy is live for you or someone else you know. We're taking applications now for end of September into October if you're interested or want someone else to be on the podcast and shared into Spotify. Feel free to fill out the form or ping Poop or myself if you don't know where the form is. So for framing purposes, um, you know, purpose of Numbers Therapy is to go through macro, bring on and showcase our experts in here more specifically. Everyone could, so that everyone can understand how all of the big pieces fit together, make better decisions with NFTs and other investments using a balanced perspective, learn about or from some of our people in here and get some different perspectives, and also learn about different areas and opportunities that exist out there as well and different ways of thinking. So, Also, as I always like to remember uh, or, or have as a reminder, there are different levels of folks in here, so it's important that everybody's along for the whole ride. If you have any questions along the way, for the live audience, right? If it's, you know, acronyms or a word that you want to find, or if it's something that's, that's you know, medium or even more advanced, please drop it into, uh, into the thread directly. We have two threads that are going, office hours chat, which tends to be, you know, memes and people, uh, people having a laugh during. And then of course we have guest questions. So if any questions, please drop it in there and I'll make sure it's spliced in at the appropriate place. And then lastly, important note and disclaimer, none of what you hear and hear is financial advice. It's all opinions. So without further ado, and on to today's guest and episode, back over a year ago, MBHQ used to have portions of polarized crews based on global location where APAC and somewhat Europe and even Africa being on mostly through until AM US time. And more on this, actually, in our discussion today. Um, our guest today, I got to know pretty well early on during that time where I was an odd U.S. early riser awkwardly interjecting into a pool of Aussies and folks in Asia. Um, his thought and ability to synthesize trends in the space, I've always been very keen to hear. His related ability to not just catch meta, but also mobilize it into smart business decisions has really been exciting to watch over time as well. And for those unfamiliar, he also had one of the first morning shows in MBHQ, or evening, I guess, depending upon what your time zone is, where they went through projects and the related detail and evolution to help people create plans for the day and the week. So he's seen a lot, and I've personally always enjoyed the time we've gotten to talk, discuss ideas, work on puzzles. As you know, he's ringing in from Oz today, which I'm also quite excited to dissect as I find that market to be a really unique one as it relates to Web3 and beyond. And I think it will be valuable to discuss in here. So buckle up. And let's please welcome my good friend Mick to the stage today. Mick, Mick, what's going on? GM, GM, and thank you for that lovely introduction. I am extremely humbled and <laughs> mirror your sentiment. You know, it's been a wild ride over the last year, and we've been through a lot in that time. So it's really great to sit down and kind of look back a little bit and dissect what went on. It definitely has been. It definitely has been. So. Let's, you know, let's start the conversation today where we tend to start every episode. So, you know, let's start with your background before Web3 and NFTs. What were you doing previously? Where was your focus? You know, whatever you feel comfortable sharing in terms of your pre-Web3, pre-NFT background. I couldn't even remember. I had to ask the wife. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, before Web3, I was primarily working in uh, finance, so de we deliver software to the banks in APAC um, and sort of work with uh, various hardware companies and other third-party vendors to, to get that done. Um, so I wasn't really in um, crypto much. Uh, it was very corporate. Um, and outside of the corporate work, uh, my day-to-day -day was sort of in the gym, bodybuilding and um, very, very different sector of the community than what would be interested in crypto investment and NFTs. Um, so finding my way into Web3 was very much a strange occurrence, to be honest. Um, I kind of 
was into uh, collecting uh, Marvel uh, trading cards and um, I liked what was uh, being done on uh, the iPhone, so on iOS, um, but it was always a little bit... Uh, I, I didn't find there was much adoption. Not too many people were on board with it. Um, so when Topshop came along and I saw what was happening there, I sort of poked my head in and, and navigated my way through from there. Um, so that was my journey to Web3. You're, you're triggering some good thoughts here, because even as you just say that and talk about Marvel, I remember some of our earlier conversations in morning, you know, my time about Vive and kind of what your history was there. And this is, you know, dating back to you know, June, July, whatever it was, August of last year. Um, so it's definitely triggering. But with Top Shot in this example, I mean, how did you hear about Top Shot originally, right? I mean, it's, of course, there's, you know, there's Twitter, other places. It's obviously would have been like a little bit easier for someone in the US to hear about it, right? Because you have a friend or a friend of a friend that kind of rippled. Do you remember how you heard of it originally? Was it Twitter or was it something else? Uh, it was a news article, uh, and I saw that you know they would they were basically um, th that was the first time I'd heard of NFTs as trading cards. Like I'd collected Crypto Kitties before, and I was in on that trend, um, but I, I didn't I didn't see that it was lasting value at that point. I didn't quite get it. And then even with Top Shot, um, I, I again found it was sort of a, a neat idea and I could see why people would, would get in on it. But I, again, I thought it was sort of like a, a passing thing. Didn't quite get it. Um, but through Top Shot, uh, I then looked around and said, well, what else is out there? Um, and that's where I landed on um, the Marble Cards and Meme.com community. Uh, and they kind of taught me about Web3 a lot more and um, NFTs and you know, what the vision was for NFTs. Um, and that's when I really found my way down the rabbit hole. So none of it was, um, it, one, one top shot was by pure chance um, and Crypto Kitties was also by pure chance for Reddit. Um, so I had a little bit of exposure, but then full adoption of Web3 was getting coached through it by a specific community on the internet, which is great. That's interesting. That's, that's a perspective and in, and an entry that we kind of we have not heard really, I'd say to date. Um, so I am curious about you know hearing about what how you kind of view the last year, let's say, right? So how would you lay out the past year in terms of like progress, or even if there were like periods in your mind in terms of like breaking down how, how you'd structure the last year? Is it, how do you think about it? I'm curious. Like what happened in the last year? Is there some kind of framework or structure you'd put on it? The last year has been an emerging market on steroids. It's been insane. I think we've seen from the, from the very inception all the way through to what I'd call a mature market in the space of 12 months. Um, I, I definitely wouldn't say we're early anymore. I think, you know, a lot of um, the establishment is there. A lot of the infrastructure is there. Um, the only thing we, we don't really have is consolidation and standardization um, in practice and, and, you know, products and services aren't fully embedded. Um, but we, we, we went from, I guess, the, the creator economy um, being identified, right? So NFTs were something that was cool and then people started buying them and profitability went up. Um, and then I think what happened was the light bulb moment went on with um, a lot of investors and they went, hey, this is a market which similar to uh, crypto um, is very, very easy to trade and potentially like even easier to market uh, because the sense of ownership is a lot better when you actually have a picture on your shit coin. <laughs> um, and, and so that was a very interesting dynamic that kicked off uh, the creator economy in a very, very big way. Um, so then we got to see everyone looking at this as a market where they could put all, put, put, their thinking cap on, come up with something cool or more likely bring something that they'd previously done into this domain and integrate it with Solidity and Web3 um, and, and enter this creator economy. So creating something new in a new domain, in a new way. Um, and there was a lot of benefits for people that, that did that early. Um, and we still see that now uh, with a lot of the sort of communities from 2021. Um, the NFT art ain't great. 
Um, there's not really much to the project, um, but being early, you know, you capitalize. So we went through that phase um, and a lot of those early projects will be with us, I would say, for as long as Web3 exists. Um, and from there, we moved into a lot of the metas. Um, so, you know, it was a lot of the rotations from um, new phases of projects. And we started to see DGen meta kick in where you had a lot of creators that maybe they they knew how to release projects, but they didn't have a great idea. <laughs> Either that or they saw the opportunity to not have to worry about implementing a great idea and instead execute really quickly on a derivative meta, on a mimetic meta. Um, and so we went through that phase. And, you know, the biggest I can think of is really the ape phase. For months, we had eight projects, one after the other coming out. And, you know, me and Vigil would talk for hours of how can we keep seeing these run? And yet for three, four months, these absurd obvious rug projects would fly um and and so that was when i think we we got our first taste of uh memes in web3 and memes in nfts and how powerful that would be um and we can probably touch on that a little bit more um later on but from there then uh, i think people were kind of really striving really looking for um legitimacy uh we started to see a bit of the bear kick in um later last year we got that little taste i think there was two or three weeks of oh shit what's going on everything's crashing um and you had that first flight to quality uh and then uh yuga bought everything back again by uh bringing in round two or round three of the ponzi um and and i think at that point we really started to blow up um, and that was probably around the, the, I want to say November, December time period. Uh, and you started to get, I think a lot of the projects that had been building in the background for a longer time. And a lot of the projects that now saw there was legitimacy in the money that could be made in this market, um, started to bring in the big guns and you had projects with a lot more high quality art. You had projects with much bigger promises, um, bigger names involved. Um, well, not not bigger names than like Gary V and, and um, sort of Beanie, ones that established themselves, but Web2, big names um, that hadn't been here before started coming in and, and bringing their brands um, and everything went nuts. Uh, and so th th at that point, I think a lot of narrative started happening about a frothy market uh, and everyone sort of wondered how high can this go? How long can this go? Um, and proof carried it uh, from there for some time. Um, and then we started to see the cracks <laughs> in the foundation. Um, and this year has been a very, very different market a very very different uh journey for people to go on um the part that i haven't really touched on yet is the underlying technology and the evolution of tools and how that lines up and i think we had this interesting dynamic where um as the market started to become cooler uh the ability for people to extract um I guess wealth from the market became a lot more tools and a lot more technology focused. Um, and so things became a lot harder for people that weren't um, on, on the cutting edge of the buyer market on the trader market. Um, so with a cooling market and um, an increase in the utilization of tools, I think that has led us to, to where we are now a little bit. Um, and then throw on top of the macro, which has been pretty nasty. Uh, and, you know, I'm not surprised that we are in uh, a period of pain. Um, and cutting it as short as I can, that's sort of how I've seen the last year go. That's a great summary. Uh, it's a great summary. It actually segues in pretty well. Uh, you know, I guess the, the question I have is, you know, where are we at right now? Are we just in a pure builder's market at this point and with a little bit of opportunity as traders? And I guess the other related question that I have, and I do not expect the perfect answer here, so it's a tricky one, but, you know, might this, you know, bear or adjusted market have happened even if the U.S. and global economies, you know, did not have issues, right? And they were still solid? Or do you think this was, do you think this was inevitable regardless? Do you think it was driven by the macro? I'm curious to hear what, what your thoughts are. 
So, yeah, I definitely think this would have happened anyway. Um, put a time horizon long enough on any NFT collection, uh, with the exception of probably some of the very early uh, grails. And you are going to see um, the bubbles popping, the Ponzi stopping and um, people rotating out. It's just natural. Uh, I think any collector industry is like that, um, with, you know, a few notable exceptions. Um so, yeah, but I do think the macro plays into it. Um, we do tend to see, and we even saw last year, um, there was this, the sentiment around when ETH went sideways, NFTs would do well. Um, and then we'd also see if we have positivity and confidence in in the crypto market, that NFTs would also see an increase in investment as well as people sort of rotate in to try to, I, I guess, stack the benefit of uh, a boost in the NFT value along with increase in ETH price, you know, you, you're really um, maximizing your gains there. So um, it's hard to say, though, how much the macro influenced the current situation. Um, my personal opinion is that, you know, we have high royalties um, and I think we have the highest royalties of any market that I know of. Um, in existence really um and i do think that that on average bleeds us uh, you need like every single time um a, a sale happens on secondary you got to factor in probably 7.5 percent of that is is going out of the market to teams and what we've seen consistently is teams are not reinvesting a lot of that back into the space you know they're paying wages which is fine um and for the last year, a lot of teams paid extraordinarily high wages, insane amounts of money um, to to their team. And, you know, there's a lot of shadiness that goes on there, too. Um, so you spread that out over all of the collections that are holding floors and trading daily. And you have an extraordinary amount of the revenue that is meant to be liquid within this space um, getting getting funneled out uh, all the time. So we do need, in my opinion, you know, a lot of new money coming in to sustain the market that we have. Um, and there's a point that that will be fine um, based on how many people are in the space. Uh, but I think that we were very frothy and it was far too much for the people we had. Um, chuck gas prices on top, um, chuck mint prices on top, um, and projects, you know, using every recourse they can to extract as much out of the mint as possible. Um, and, and the excuses were, were quite amusing. You know, we had the, the um, repeated uh, justification for uh, very, very high Dutch auction prices as being to avoid gas wars when, you know, we, we just know that's not the case. Um, so I put all of that together and, and I think that we were always going to end up where we are. Um, and something tells me that that was going to happen regardless of the macro. Um, but I think the macro may have just accelerated a little bit. Yeah, it makes you wonder whether a possible missing piece here is, you know, the combination of accountability, maybe regulation to some extent, right? Because the trend that you're saying, right, is, okay, we don't have a problem with compensating creators, right? 5%, 7%, whatever it is, on an ongoing basis, they have to earn money, right? Like they're creating value, they're, they're producing that kind of a thing. But there is some expectation about the fact that they are going to reinvest it, right? And you're investing in this project for the longer term, and it has to be growing, right? There, there has to be value add that exists so it can continue to grow. That's kind of the premise that everybody's putting in. Like you're putting in your money, you're putting in your energy, right? To be part of the community and hopefully get, help the thing catalyze. I wonder if, if there is just like more accountability. And I don't know if that means, you know, more doxing, for instance. I don't know if that means just better, you know, better regulation around it, possibly, if that would affect things to some extent, such that, you know, the expectation is much like if you were investing in a normal, you know, a Web2 business or project, right, is that you have, let's call it like fiduciary duty that exists, right? Like you actually have to back the people who are investing in your project to be able to create long term value. And you can't just, you know, <laughs> have something mint, take the money, you know, let it bleed out and just rug, essentially, right? Any thoughts there? Do you think that that would be a helpful piece? What's what's uh, what's triggering for you? I think it's definitely going to create a whole lot of volatility when we do start to introduce regulation. Um, and I think it's going to do a whole lot of things wrong before we start doing things right. Um, but I, I have a very different take. And I think NFTs at the moment are thought about 
in the wrong way. I think the creator economy um, has made NFTs be seen as a product uh, when I don't think they should be per se. I think projects should be looking at a service model. And I come from that background, so it's very native to me. Um, but when you're in a business, it's like, what are the services I'm providing? I don't see NFTs as a service. I just, I just don't. Um, and, you know, they arguably could be a product, um, but really I think they should support a product or a service. Um, and so what that means is, you know, they are a tool to sell something of value. And if a project is providing a service, then in my opinion, they should be able to uh, charge a subscription uh, rather than have secondary royalties on an NFT. And if they have got high secondary royalties on an NFT because they have to run a subscription model, but they aren't providing utility or a service, I just don't think that's a tenable uh, business model at all. So I feel like the, the way that NFTs are used and marketed needs to shift. Yeah, yeah, that definitely makes sense. The concept of it being more of a capability and something you can integrate into your business. It, it kind of also makes you wonder, right, about, and we talked about it, this, I think, once before, but the name, the, even the name NFT, right? Like, is it something that just becomes obsolete over time because it's just a, you know, a membership product or, you know, whatever it is, right? And the, with the underlying technology and, and the name NFT just becomes obsolete possibly over time. Um, and I think that's maybe a possibility as well. Um, so currently, you know, we're kind of in this like, what are we in this tweener, like meme meta somewhere within there? Like, where do you think we're at right now? Like, what do you, what do you think is happening right now in the in, I guess, the NFT market? Um, wh where are we at? Is it just a bunch of projects that, you know, enable some trading and keep some, keep some activity while people are building in the background? And as that coincides with the macro correcting to some extent, we'll start to see a little bit more of a, of a propelling of the NFT market and, and it'll take off from there? Like, how are you thinking about the current market and the current stage that we're at right now? I don't really think anything has changed in some time. I think we're we're kind of in a, a period of uh, sideways NFT um, direction. Uh, people are still you know, sticking with the flight to quality narrative. Um, a lot of people are stabled. And I think a lot of the reason we haven't seen money re-enter is because ETH's gone high and no one really expected it to within the NFT space. Um, so a lot of people are very, very heavy stable. Um, and I don't know that anything is going to change for some time until we see that money come back in. Um, I think people are looking for trends and people are looking to be guided into trends. Um, so, you know, following wallets and following uh, price action is more important now in the short term than it's ever been. Uh, knowing when to exit is extraordinarily important. Um, and that's been the case since the free mint meta kind of took over uh, post goblins um so where we go from here uh, i was chatting to kai just before uh stream about uh, the the look that there is some money coming back into blue chips at the moment um and speculation around you know what's driving that uh, is you know interesting and i don't think we have a, an answer yet um but i i a lot of people would have opinions on where we're going to be in the next two months. Um, I'm not sure personally. I, I don't know. I, I suspect that we may see some bumps and ups and downs, but we are probably going to not be too far from where we are now. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. I, I think I tend to agree with you. Um, something else that, you know, that you and I have talked about as well is the fact that, gob you know, post goblins, et cetera, we are in this kind of meme land, but, I know it's something that you've spent a lot of time and attention on. Is it possible for you to give your definition of what memes are? Like, how would you define what a meme is here? I'm curious because sure. I feel like your definition is going to be a little bit different than most people. Yeah, no problem. Um, so, and that is part of the reason why I've been uh, very absent within um, the alpha space for the the last minute. Uh, I joined the meme.com team uh, and working on their platform build. Uh, and, you know, it's been a really great experience working with that group, their OGs in the space. Uh, they've been here since 2017, 2018. Um, and, you know, one of the first projects on Polygon to, uh, to kind of produce a, a mass NFT project. Um, and there's a lot of guys in there that are very, very knowledgeable about 
um, the the whole concept of something that's mimetic and I've learned a lot working with them. Um, so my opinion on that is uh, memes, there's two things. There's internet memes and then there's a concept of a meme. Uh, and internet memes are kind of what we all relate to as Pepe the Frog or, or Harold or Doge or, or what have you, right? Um, and there's a specific way that they are typically used. They're usually very um, satire-driven, very comedic. Uh, they're, they're relatable uh, in a lot of ways, and they get reused over and over and over and over again. Um, and the difference between that and you know, traditional mimetic um, qualities is is that part of the derivative. So. Um, moving away from an internet meme to a standard meme, anything can be a meme. Um, and, and the easiest way to kind of understand it is just replace the term meme with trend. Um, if there is something new that comes up, which a lot of people relate to and they want to and they want to reproduce that in any way, um, then you start to see those reproductions or derivatives um, spill out into a cultural trend of some kind. Uh, and if it is a cultural trend and that does spread and it does um, create uh, somewhat of a, a groundswell, that's where you start to call it a meme. Um, so you'll hear people even now uh, trying to reference memes in gen art, which is um, if, if you said that in the normie space, they wouldn't understand what the hell you're talking about. But that's what they're sort of relating to. Are there uh, form factors? Are there styles which are emerging in Web3 gen art or, or in gen art in general um, that are being heavily reproduced? And then that would be a meme. It's, it's interesting to get your perspective on that definition, right? Because it, it's almost like multiple, you know, um, barriers that anybody who's in the NFT space are facing as it relates to like normies and, and more people coming in, right? Like not only do we have, you know, the one definition that everybody has to fight, which is like the perception of NFTs. And I was literally having this debate with somebody on a LinkedIn thread the other day third person who I don't even know, right, not even attached to the thread about the perception of NFTs and, and clearly like their their perception of it. I mean, while I, I like hearing different perspectives was not fully informed, let's say. Uh, and then on top of it, you have something like this also, right, memes, which people tend to perceive in a certain way, but there's more to it than that. So it's really, it's really interesting to hear, you know, your your perspective and your, you know, the way you think about that, given how close you've been to, to kind of the, the mimetic side of things. Um, I'm curious where you think the market goes, right? Since you, you are talking about trends, you know, how does Web2, how does util, you know, utility fit into the market moving forward, right? Is this, do you think that the market moving forward is going to be more trends that are, that continue to be defined by Web3 and created by Web3? You think Web2 is going to integrate more? How will they play well together? Are they just two completely separate things? And this may also tie into your, you know, the, your, your response that you in, in comment you made earlier, right, about the fact that NFTs are technology, right? They're 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 a function. It's not so much a product necessarily standalone. Um, so I'm curious to hear what, what you know. Where where's your head at? Where do you think things are going? How does Web two fit in? You know those kinds of things. There is a lot to unpick here, uh, and <laughs> I'll, I'll try to take maybe one or two um, slices of the pie. So where do I think? Um, how do I think memes are going to hang around in, in Web3? And I think memes go extremely well here. Trends go extremely well here. And we saw that in crypto. Um, you know, you've you've got a market and people want to use this market. It's a very, very easy market to buy and sell, uh, to profit from. Um, and when you have an unregulated market that's very easy to use, it becomes quite explosive. So people need something that they can use to produce their own content in a way that's recognizable and relatable so they can draw from you know, the value of trends and populations that are already um, within that that market. Um, and I think, you know, Web3 is a catalyst that enables memes to kind of explode. Um, and yeah, that's why I don't think they're going anywhere. And they're always going to be very, very important in Web3 while there is the market, the open market that we have. Um, and in general, in culture, you know, I think we're seeing, uh, you know, globalization drive 
more and more people, bigger populations across the world, we're all getting content from the same places. We're all absorbing um, sources uh, in the same way. Uh, so we aren't having a lot of different you know, cultural groups, a lot of these echo chambers as much. Um, and with that, trends become even more powerful. You know, more people are, uh, are latching onto trends more quickly. So you put those things together and, you know, our, our cultures, our societies, the way that we um, live, it just is going more mimetic in general. We are more trend based. Um, so both of those things, I think, are bullish for, for memes in general and in Web3. Um, which is great. But one thing that took to counter that one thing that I'm less bullish on with uh, memes in Web3 is sort of the forced meme, um, something that, you know, it starts as a meme, but it's not really that adopted. And then it gets shilled and promoted and pushed and the price value forces it to become a meme. You know, the, the content wasn't that great. The memes weren't that funny or the trend wasn't that strong, but it gets market made and forced down our throats to a point that, you know, we just have to say it's a meme, have to say it's a trend. And everyone in the community behind it um, kind of parrots the same thing because they've got bag holds and they really want it to be. So the price goes up. And I think that's very, very negative on the mimetic sense because organic trends are so much more i guess legitimate than than false ones it's funny it's funny you're saying that because as you're saying this right it, it kind of feels like memes and nfts just very naturally could intertwine together as a result right so they say so they both kind of have if anybody looking in from the outside right it, they both have the same kind of effect which is which is you know these things are ridiculous it doesn't make any sense right and of course like any bad Apple bad project like that's where it comes from right I mean they hear the bad stories and that's where they draw the conclusions from so pretty interesting how those uh, how those intertwine so let's let's shift gears a little bit here uh, as well I, I'm really excited to hear about this and hear what your perspective is but you know how would you categorize web 3 in Australia specifically and, and let's maybe start local to start um, what are your friends reactions to NFTs do they own you know how about other people that you see like what, what does that look like yeah, so um, I, I mentioned at the start that I don't really come from a background that is in uh, crypto. And uh, I guess, you know, family, friends, pretty much everyone that I would deal with in my daily life uh, haven't touched NFTs. Um, I did get some friends interested very early on, uh, more of the ones that are, are technically focused and, and like technology in general um, and the emergence of new technology, but um, their interest didn't really hold because of the market side. You know, um, I think if it was a slower market, if things were in that creative phase for a lot longer um, and the price action wasn't as high and the narrative wasn't as negative, um, I think a lot more of them might have stuck around and um, maybe, you know, played the game a little bit more. Um, but for me, I'm kind of a lone wolf. I'm the only one I know who's, who's in the scene. Um, and that's probably due to the age group as well. You know, I'm, I'm sort of uh, up around near 40. Um, so I think it's very much a younger crowd in the Web3 NFT space. Um, and I think there's a, a valid reason for that too. You know, you need that drive. You need the time as well. And, you know, we can talk about the Australian time zone, um, finding people here who are willing to be up at, at you know, 2, 3, 4 a.m. and then put a day's work in afterwards. It's rare. Uh, and, you know, I feel the pain myself. So I don't have too many people exposed um, outside of the wonderful uh, family I have uh, here in Web3. That's definitely interesting. We're, we're going to touch on that a little bit later. because I, I, curi I am curious to hear about your perspective on time zones and all, all those good kinds of things. So it sounds like what you're saying is you think that your, you know, your friends, your network, are a little bit, you know, uh, more conservative or they have jobs. They certainly don't want to get up at odd hours. And also maybe there was a little bit of risk, maybe risk aversion in terms of the volatility and craziness in the market. And when you put all of those pieces together, like the equation just wasn't there. Is that is that a decent summary? Yeah, I would I would condense it down to um, they are about as normie as normie gets. Uh, and we are in no way, shape or form normie friendly uh, yet. Got it. 
Um, so maybe going outside of your of your friend group, do you see remnants elsewhere? Um, you know, of folks who are who are climbing into Web three, climbing into NFTs. Is that something that you you know you catch a lot of ads on? You know, on on TV. You know, you walk the streets and you see ads. Is that something you're, you're catching some buzz about as well? Where maybe your friends aren't touching it, but there's pretty decent adoption. It's becoming a thing. Like, what have you seen there? Anything anything come to mind? There are tiny little pockets uh, which are emerging here. Um, you know, Sydney and Melbourne definitely leading the charge, uh, but it's not like in, in other countries, at least from a commercial sense. There are a lot of traders. Um, per capita, we have a, a huge adoption of Web3 and NFTs. Um, I'm, I'm just not, you know, I, I don't live in that space. Um, but from a commercial sense, I think it's going to take time. Um, I know that abroad, and even in the company that I work for in my daily job, they're investigating the metaverse and they're investigating NFTs. Um, but but locally, um, I think you've got the likes of Alluvium. You've got some decent community uh, leads uh, from various NFT communities that are here. Um, I even have a local barbecue joint that I shill every now and then who makes the best barbecue in existence. Like I challenge anyone in America, hands down, the barbecue here is better than the best you've ever had. Uh, and uh, they do an NFT, uh, which acts as a subscription token. So you, if you hold their top tier NFT, you get a... Um, uh, one of their monthly specials, which are these gigantic concoctions that they come up with, like these monstrous two and a half kilo tacos um, or in these entire lamb legs that they do um, and dish up on the table so you can create your own Slovakis. And so you get that every month as well as um, access to merch and sources and things that they have in store. Um, and then they're creating on the side uh, their own DAO, um, which is hilarious to think a barbecue joint doing a crypto DAO, but they are. Um, and, you know, th it's real Web2 utility. It's probably the best Web2 utility of any NFT that I own. Um, bar none and so you know these little things are emerging um it's just there, there's nothing linking them all up yet yeah yeah that makes sense the thing that stands out to me though and, and why i happen i find australia to be pretty interesting is is why there are so many traders why there, why there is so much you know adoption at least from the trading standpoint or the crypto standpoint that side of things right and australia is I think about 25 million population, you know, I have a small sample size of friends that I speak with or, you know, who live there from there. And it just always feels like it over indexes, but it goes beyond, of course, just my little sample size of friends. You know, it goes beyond that, too. And it just always seems like it over indexes. Like, do you have any thoughts on why that's the case? Is is the culture in general just more risk tolerant? Is it more open or is it more communication you know in, in cross pollination like what what's happening exactly why why is there, why are there so many traders in in australia why are there so many people who are open to something like this any idea what's happening I think we're very tech forward um, and maybe, you know, we have small brother um, <laughs> syndrome or middle sibling, whatever you want to call it, uh, where we see a lot of the, the larger countries, um, a lot of the big, bigger populations have got so much better internet. They've got so much better accessibility. Um, their markets are a lot more connected and the, the opportunity in the tech space, um, you know, for many years was a lot bigger abroad. Um, and so we are very willing to move on new technology and um, try new uh, technological trends um, in, in Australia. And that's all the way up to big corporate. Um, so, you know, in the financial sector of our work, um, contactless and cardless technology inside uh, banking ATMs, uh, we were the first to do it um, in the whole world. Um, and you know, with, within banking switching and many other aspects of sort of the the underpinning um, infrastructure and software that the banks use, um, the entire world we are typically the first to get something into production and live, um, at least in in our organisation. Um, and that you see everywhere: indie startups, um, gaming. Uh, it's just a a cultural thing. Yes. Um, why I can't exactly say. Um, but we do love our tech. It's a little bit catalyzing though, right? Like once the ball starts rolling on that, right, then it just becomes ingrained in the culture and then you're snowballing and you're kind of on your way. And uh, it, it seems like, and what's interesting about it too, is like, if you could just contrast it, you know, we had, we had Shervon, um, I think it was last week, 
and shares in the UK. And we were talking about the UK. UK, you know, the the, the demographics are, are reasonably similar from like a high level, right? I mean, median income is pretty similar. Um, you know, average age and, and the demographic breakdown, pretty similar. Um, and yet that culture is notoriously conservative, right? I guess not just the UK, but but maybe even broader Europe too, but like notoriously conservative. So you look at the two of them and you're like, why is this the case? But it's such a, such a big difference. And, you know, a, a couple other places that we're hoping to hit in coming weeks too would be, you know, Turkey and Estonia, which also really stand out to me as like heavy adopters as well. Um, so I'm, I'm very curious to hear what they say there as well. But it's, it's good insight that you're giving from, from your side about how ingrained, you know, technology, not just Web3, but technology is um, everywhere. So what so right now, like you said, it's in this kind of trading phase. So there are a lot of traders. There's a little bit of technology, right? Like there's a restaurant that that kind of has this Web3 applied element to it. Right. Um, like you said, it's not so connected. What does it take to get to mass adoption, do you think? In, in Australia? Is it, you know, just more pragmatic use cases? Is that what it really is? Is it de-risking and, and, and removing volatility from an investor standpoint? Like, what, what do you think that formula looks like to get wider uptake in, in Australia? I think mass adoption comes with mass production, really, uh, and, and standardization of uh, the tools, which will add confidence, a little bit of regulation around it. Accessibility is a big thing. There's a, there's a bunch of factors that's going to lead to mass adoption. But for NFTs specifically, um, I think being able to buy them a lot easier, being able to um, access them once you've bought them a lot easier, um, time in the market as well as a big thing for normies to kind of understand that this isn't going away. This is something that um, is is going to be ingrained in what we do. Um, but the biggest thing I think is is mass production. So what DEC has done with um, an infinite supply NFT I think is really interesting and adding value to the NFT based on how people um, use the platform and use the service that they're providing uh, is something that I think is great. Um, and, and I think if we go down that path more and bigger brands start to understand how that model could work and find ways to integrate that model into their daily, daily way of working, um, that will help mass adoption. Um, and I think as well that people will probably mass adopt NFTs without even knowing that they're mass adopting NFTs. Yeah. I, I, I tend to agree with what you're saying there. <laughs> that ties back to the naming thing uh, that I was mentioning. But so, so a related, you know, I think really meaty question that I'm excited about. You touched on this earlier, but it, it crosses over both an answer you had earlier and then the comment you made as well. Um, the comment you made earlier, right, is that trends are being shared globally, right? So you can have new new collections, new memes, whatever, and they can get adopted globally, right? So everybody can get excited about it. Probably like a little bit of regionality, but more and more that's becoming a thing, right? Where everybody can adopt it globally, everyone can attach to the same brands, that kind of a thing, right? Yet, for the last you know year, you've been waking up at 2 a.m., right? To be able to go mint and, and go online and, and attach yourself to the to the Web3 space and, and be able to, to, pro- to profit off it. So how did those two how do those two come together? How does how does how do we get away from the fact that people in Australia are going to have to wake up at two a.m.? Is it just a a sheer product of project creators, and we need more project creators that are in Australia and other places? And oh yeah, by the way, even if that does happen, is that really going to solve the bias that exists anyway? You know, given the smaller population, like how do we correct that so it can be a, a, a more of a balanced economy? Will there still be regionality? Do you think? Like, where do you think that's going? I think it'll be a split market. I think you're always going to have uh, the the trader market that is focusing on the trader collections, um, and you know that's been the case with uh, altcoin or or crypto launches since you know the the beginning of time, um, and it's going to be the case here. But you are going to have the secondary part of the market, which is what I touched on before in terms of those infinite collections, um, which are more normie centric, which are more accommodating for a global market um, that don't put a lot of um, reliance on being there on the dot for the launch, um, trying to have all the tools ready to be able to buy two or three items competing with everybody else. It's like you want in, you're in. Uh, And then from there, it's more of a gradual um, process to deliver value to holders. 
I think that will be how we work around time zone issues um, and mass adoption, which I think go hand in hand. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes that makes a lot of sense. I think all, uh, building on top of what you're saying, there could also be projects, right, that have an element, a sub brand or a sub product or something that have, have connection across all of them, but cater to various regions too, right? To be able to integrate everyone together, have have um, you know cater also from like a minting and a purchasing and in you know trading standpoint to various markets too under one brand possibly too that enables maybe the connectivity across regions but also tailors to the different regions as well so maybe that's a possibility as well um so you know maybe the last question i have for you i want to be cognizant of time i know you uh you've got the kids running around and you've got a lot on your hands but what are you most excited about into the future regarding web3 or nfts is anything standing out to you that's that's particularly exciting that you think is either immediately impending or you're looking a bit further out um what what stands out for me it's platform uh, integration so i definitely like um that people are starting to think that way and you know that's why i'm i'm on uh, the moon.com team because I, I like what they're doing there um and and what deck has done it's a it's a similar sort of a thing where you know the focus is going to be on what is the service that we can provide to people in Web3 that is a Web3 native service? Um, what can we do in this space which builds on the foundation of um, NFTs and crypto, but brings in ways to kind of socially uh, integrate um, and, and use um platforms in a new way that we might not think of at the moment uh, in Web3. And I know we've got the metaverse, right? And that's that's its own thing, and that's going to have its own timeline. But I think abstracting from the, the metaverse where there's a physical presence, you know, this idea of a metaverse where your identity is the metaverse and, and your Google login and is already the first stages of the metaverse, um, I definitely think that is more important because that's what is going to get more adoption. Um, so, you know, one thing that we're trying to focus on in what we're creating is how do we provide people a way to get on board it into Web3 and get involved in Web3 um, and get interested and learn about the things in Web3 without necessarily having to be up at 3 a.m. or be attached to um, specific alpha communities um, and, and stay across trends and, and um, memes and all that sort of thing. Um, and I think that's really interesting to me is, is what is coming next that kind of ties the foundations of Web3 and NFTs together into um, something that everyone wants to use. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, anecdotal data point, right? And I'm sure everybody's experienced some version of this lately, but I have had more than one friend WhatsApp group um, that, you know, that, that, that put a comment in probably in the past week that said, remember when this pet rock went for $1.5 million or something like that. So <laughs> I still think we're definitely definitionally off, it seems like. Um, and I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think that not just like the on ramp from the from the financial standpoint, but also the on ramp in terms of knowledge and comfort and in uh, product and customer experience. Uh, that is very exciting. I think that would be a really, really, uh, a really, really good thing to see. It seems like we have a question that's coming in also. I'm just reading real fast. Uh, since employment opportunities in this space are still too few, the fastest way to bring money from a certain market into this market is to develop an agency platform with good Web3 style products. Do you all think people will be interested on the NFT job-based affiliate marketing agency platform to build the content and help the branding for community products need feedback for this? So I'm not sure if that's explicitly pointed at you, but I think what they're asking is, do you think agencies are liable to crop up to help facilitate creating new projects, basically? And do you think that's going to be a pretty popular model that we see? Keeping in mind, I think what you said, right, which is that NFTs are a tool, right? They're not necessarily a pure product. But what are your thoughts about that? Do you think we're going to see more and more agencies cropping up? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there has to be the um, viability of the business. So you've got to ensure that there's going to be enough interest to warrant um, something like that. Uh, but it already kind of exists. You've already got advisors, um, which are very, very highly paid on projects. Um, and I think that advisory 
um, path is going to lead into full agencies being established. They, they're probably already there. I assume if not local globally, you're already going to be able to Google and find those groups. Uh, and as the space continues to grow, um, those opportunities are going to solidify and you're going to see some, some consistent names um, pop up as new projects are announced. Um, so I definitely think that is a thing. So to summarize for your greenie, yes, agencies exist. Yes, there's probably still room for more. Um, and also consider Web3 and, and NFTs not as just creating products, but being a facilitator, let's say, right? And helping brands and other and memes and, and other, other places mobilize projects and utilize this technology and not just NFTs as a, as a product specifically. So um, cheers to you as well. So with all that said, I think it's a pretty good time to be able to wrap here, Mick. Um, you've been a total trooper. I really appreciate it with all that I know that's that's going on on your side and sick kids and, uh, and, and, and limited sleep and all that good stuff. Nobody would have known it if I didn't just spill the beans about it. Um, <laughs> really, really appreciate you, you, you know, you being on, taking the time. Love hearing your perspective, especially about this topic about memes, which are like something we say so liberally, but like don't take time to think about necessarily. So it's just really, really great conversation. Um, everyone who's joining live, thank you so much for joining live as well. Much appreciated. Uh, next week, I think we're traveling to Turkey next week, which is one of the two countries that um, that I'd mentioned. Um, so TBD in terms of time, it will be Thursday. It's always Thursday, uh, at least in the U.S. Uh, there, there goes that that international bias again. <laughs> Thursday, at least in the U.S. <laughs> Uh, TBD in terms of what time, but we'll, of course, uh, be sure to tell everyone for anyone who wants to tune in live. And again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining, and we'll see everybody in VC1. Thanks, everyone.